Thank you everyone for joining today. This webinar will begin shortly. We're just going to allow a few moments here to have other people join us on this webinar. We wanted to go over a few housekeeping items in the interim. First, we want this to be interactive and educational. And so we will be having a dedicated Q&A period at the end of our presentation. However, we welcome you to share your questions and comments in the chat window. You can also send us uh, questions in the Q&A section, and you can see a Q&A feature as part of this webinar platform. We are offering closed captioning, as well as Zoom technical support if you need it. You can also chat us if you need help. We want this to be something we learn from, and so we ask that you please also share your feedback with us. We are chatting out the URL so you can access that feedback form if you would take a few seconds to fill that out either during the middle or end of the session. We also want to welcome you to join our community. This is just an initial engagement, but we want to stay connected to you long term. So we welcome you to follow us on Twitter. We also welcome you to join us on LinkedIn. With that, we are delighted to welcome you to our pre-application webinar, Developing Financial and Legal Planning Platforms for AD, ADRD Caregivers. Today, we will be doing an overview of the National Institute on Aging, SBIR, and ACTR programs. We'll be hearing from the Administration for Community Living as well as getting into some of the details about our solicitation. And then we'll have a moderated Q&A with all of our esteemed panelists. Again, please use the Q&A function on your viewer. I'd like to introduce our featured speakers today. We have Dr. Todd Heim. He's from the Office of Small Business Research at the National Institute on Aging. You'll hear us use the acronym NIA. We also welcome Vijeth Yangar and he is the Brain Health and Lead and Technical Advisor at the Administration for Community Living. Welcome. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Dana Plude, Deputy Director at the Division of Behavioral and Social Research at the National Institute on Aging as well. And I'm your moderator, Monique LaRock. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Hein from NIA. Thank you very much, Monique, and thank you to the other panelists. I think you'll find a very informative panel. You know, for anyone that is thinking about this RFA, an RFA that we're really excited about. So next slide. I'm going to start with by giving an overview of how the SBR program works, um, how we're structured at DNIA in terms of the small business programs, um, you know, eligibility, things of that nature, and then I will turn it over to both uh, Vijay Iyengar and Dana Plude, who will speak more about the scientific goals of both the ACL and the NIA, as well as the, the specifics of what we're looking for in this FOA. So just to orient you, I am at the National Institute of Aging, I'm sorry, on aging. Um, we are the, I manage the Office of Small Business Research, where we have really six core functions. We essentially coordinate the program across the Institute. We provide guidance to applicants. So as you, and I'll talk more about that, as you're applying, we're a initial point of contact for you. Um, we do outreach just as this webinar is showing. Uh, we develop funding opportunities as we did here. Uh, we're involved in helping our innovators network with the people that they'll need to network with to commercialize their products and also to network with stakeholders. Um, and then we're also involved in helping implement uh, entrepreneurship training for those that would benefit from it. Next slide. So the Small Business Innovation Research and the Small Business Technology Transfer Program, SBIR and STTR, they're both congress congressionally mandated programs. This RFA is specific to the SBIR program, which is the larger of the two. 3.2% uh, of federal agencies that provide extramural funding must, that 3.2% of that extramural funding must go to 
small businesses using the SBIR program. Next slide. So again, th this one's specific on SBIR, but this shows you the two programs. STTR is very similar, but there is a requirement for an academic partner, with it, whereas with SBIR, it is often the case, but not required. And total, these programs result in about $1.2 billion a year. Um, at the NIA, it's estimated to be about $120 million this year. Next slide. So that's $120 million going to small businesses using SBIR grants and contracts, mainly grants at the NIA um, and to SDTR. Um, it is, those grants are seed funding. So it's not like a private investor. There's, it's not a loan. There's no repayment. There's no impact on stocks or shares. It really is grant funding to the startup of small business. The small business retains all the intellectual property rights. It, the funding not only provides the capital needed to get you to that key inflection point, but also provides recognition, verification, and visibility. Next slide. So in order to be eligible, you essentially have to meet the United States Small Business Administration's definition of a U.S. small business. So you must be organized for profit in the U.S., be under 500 employees, be owned and operated by U.S. individuals, majority, meaning over 50%, or be owned and operated majority by venture capital operating firms in the U.S. as long as no single firm owns greater than 50%. Next slide. So at the NIA, we strategically fund innovations for, you know, a variety of age-related um, diseases, challenges, and opportunities. Uh, Alzheimer's disease and AD-related dementias are a key priority area for the Institute. We are the lead federal agency for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but we're also very interested in helping support the development and implementation of technology that enable aging in place, that enhance healthy aging, uh, that address age-related diseases and conditions, and the development of research tools and care management technologies that is so critical. And on the right, it, you see the pie chart that shows, you know, a current estimation of the types of technological modalities that we are funding. Next slide. So the SBIR program is structured in phases per Congress, no correlation to clinical trial nomenclature for when applicable, the more the majority of our projects are in fact preclinical. Um, a phase one SBIR is usually up to one year, generally can be up to $300,000 total cost, um, and establish technical merit, feasibility, and potential commercialization. Whereas a phase two is usually up to two million total cost, usually two years in length, um, and it requires a commercialization plan. So it's a little later stage, and there's more that we ask for up front. A fast track is a way to combine a phase one application and a phase two application in one. And this is important because for this RFA, we chose to limit it to fast tracks and direct to phase twos because we were looking for technologies that are closer to commercialization and, you know, technologies that we thought would be appropriate for these two mechanisms. So if you are really, you know, relatively early stage, maybe you have, um, you know, ideas and you think you could put those ideas together into a fast track, that could work. If you already have a prototype and now you want to kind of do that validation study of the prototype, that's where you can actually skip the phase one altogether and come in for the direct to phase two. And then once you're funded with a phase two, um, whether it be through a fast track or a director phase two, there are later stage funding opportunities such as the commercialization readiness pilot and the phase two B, which are each about $3 million in total costs. Next slide. So in terms of submitting your application and what has to go into that budget, um, you know, the limits are total costs. There are restrictions as to how much can be subcontracted 
in your application, you can request, and we do actually encourage you to request a 7% fee. There is a fee section. That is called the company profit, but it's really the only funding you can get from the NIH where we don't ask you any questions about how you're spending it. And you'll find, you know, as a business, that money becomes very important for things like legal fees or, you know, management fees or things that aren't typically uh, supported by NIH. And then it's important to note that you can also include fee-for-service type activities as part of the company course. Next slide. So we have several funding opportunities in addition to the one we're discussing today. So if you don't fit the one we're discussing today, you may fit either the Omnibus, which is investigator initiated. It's across the NIH um, and the NIA of course participates. Um, and, and that's really anything addressing, to a addressing aging will come to the NIA through the Omnibus. The, other solicitation to mention is PS 19-316 and 317, which is, I like to call it the omnibus for Alzheimer's disease. It's really a open-ended solicitation to address Alzheimer's disease from every angle, whether it be therapeutics, prevention, behavioral health technologies, sensors, you know, anything that would address the prevention, treatment, diagnosis, or care of Alzheimer's disease and research. Next slide. I mentioned the commercialization readiness pilot as a later stage initiative. Uh, also to note, there is the diversity supplement once you're funded by the NIH. And there's another funding opportunity if you're looking to look at NIH developed technologies, an interesting funding opportunity is that SBR tech transfer funding opportunity. Next slide. So at the NIA, we also have resources to help you, um, to help you, whether it be to help you apply, to help you once you're funded. For those that have not been funded before by the NIH, you can definitely consider the Applicant Assistance Program, which is run up leading up to each application due date, uh, each general application due date. So there will be a, a call launch shortly for the January 5th due date, which is the next due date for the omnibus and that AD solicitation. Um, we also, you know, in your application, you can include budget for technical assistance. I mentioned the diversity supplement. There are a variety of entrepreneurial training programs, such as C3I and uh, i -Corps. And the NIH has also launched the Small Business Entrepreneurial Education Development Office, they call SEED, um, which has access to a variety of instrumental resources like entrepreneurs and residents, regulatory specialists, reimbursement specialists, et cetera. Next slide. So I mentioned that, you know, we are here to help you in your application and, and that the same is true for this RFA. So if you are planning on applying, you are welcome to send us at least a month before the due date a specific AIMS page. Um, and the way I recommend you think about that page is that the first half to two thirds of the page really tell the reviewers and the program staff out of all the applications that the NIH gets, why is this the one they should be most excited about? And that includes a mention of, you know, what is a technology prototype to be developed? What is the innovation in that prototype, the unmet need being addressed and the technical challenges, the value proposition, the competitive advantage, textual highlights of any preliminary data that you would include in the rest of the solicitation, um, and the relevance of the R&D &D to NIA's mission. And then the last third to half a page will be the specific games for the proposed project. So going back to a point I mentioned before, in terms of a fast track versus a directive phase two, the preliminary data is one distinguishing point. So if you already have preliminary data, then the direct to phase two is applicable. But if you don't have any preliminary data, then you will need to go the fast track route because in order to be eligible for direct to phase two, you have to essentially shown that you've done proof of concept type work, which would have been equivalent to a phase one using other funds. So in that case, in the director phase two, there is a requirement to have that preliminary data, but there is not that requirement for a fast track. Next slide. So I now like to introduce Vijesh Iyengar, who will speak about the administration for community living. 
And we really worked in collaboration together to develop this funding opportunity that is a, a great opportunity addressing both of our needs, both of our needs and goals, the ACL and the NIA. So for Jeff, take it away. Thanks very much, Todd, uh, for the handoff and for providing an overview of the SBIR STTR program and this RFA. My name is Vijeth Ingar. I'm the Brain Health Lead and Technical Advisor at the U.S. Administration for Community Living, or ACL, an operating division of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. As Todd mentioned, ACL is a proud partner and collaborator with the National Institute on Aging for this RFA and this program. With the time I have with you all today, I'll provide a brief introduction to the core mission, services, and activities of ACL in addition to providing a brief overview of the science and empirical findings undergirding this program. Next slide, please. The Administration for Community Living, or ACL, brings together the efforts and achievements of the Administration on Aging, AOA, the Administration on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, AIDD, and the HHS Office on Disability to serve as the federal agency responsible for increasing access to community supports while focusing attention and resources on the unique needs of older Americans and people with disabilities across the lifespan. Next slide, please. Services, programs, and activities delivered by ACL touch some of the most medically vulnerable segments of our population, including those individuals who are below 150% of the poverty line, those individuals that are frail and vulnerable, or those individuals at risk for emergency room visits and hospitalization, or at risk for nursing home admission. ACL works closely with the aging network of providers to reach these individuals. Next slide, please. Specifically, via the Older Americans Act and through the Administration on Aging, a unit housed within ACL, the agency has helped nearly 11 million older adults remain at home through low cost community-based services through its strong bi-directional relationships with state units on aging, tribal organizations, and area agencies on aging, or AAAs, which are public or private nonprofit agencies designated by a state to address the needs and concerns of all older persons at the regional and local levels. Providing services and supports to our nation's older adults is increasingly critical as this segment of the population continues to grow in numbers. In the next few slides, I'll provide both a demographic and empirical basis for the importance of this new program from NIA and ACL. Next slide, please. Demographic data from the World Health Organization, the United Nations, the US Census, and other organizations highlight the global increase in numbers of individuals aged 60 years or older in the coming decades. This becomes clear when looking at comparisons of say 2015 as depicted on this slide and population projections in 2050 as found on the subsequent slide. Next slide, please. As is abundantly clear from this slide of population projections in the year 2050, in the coming decades, there will be significant shifts in demography. Next slide, please. Closer to home, if we, if we take a look at recent projections and estimates, there's expected to be a rise in the number of older adults age 65 and over in the US over the next several decades. This pattern that we expect in the US largely mirrors that of population projections for the world. So for example, those in the 65 to 84 year old age range are thought to grow in numbers in China, India, and Indonesia, for example. In short, our populations are getting older and as a result, it is incumbent to meet the needs of this growing population. Next slide, please. Paralleling these demographic trends in the number of older adults is a rise in the number of individuals requiring care and in turn, the number of care family caregivers. Data from AARP, the National Alliance for Caregiving and other organizations underscore this accompanying trend with data from a 2015 report highlighting the increasing economic value of caregivers that will continue to increase in the years to come uh, with the number of older adults increasing in the decades to come as well. Next slide, please. Driving this hidden economic value of unpaid family caregivers is the panoply of responsibilities, demands, and challenges faced by family caregivers in the course of the provision of care. Available survey data 
from 2017 of family caregivers highlights that a vast majority of family caregivers provide emotional and social support, enact financial caregiving duties, and provide household support while simultaneously facing challenges in the provision of support, including to tolls on their own mental health, emotional well-being, and overall personal health. As highlighted from the survey data on the slide, financial caregiving is a responsibility undertaken by many family caregivers. On the next few slides, we dive a bit deeper as to the forms of financial caregiving that's provided in data that's, that, that's available from another survey. Next slide, please. When examining the types of financial management tasks executed by a family caregiver for a friend and or relative, as identified by another survey on the slide, categories of financial caregiving that emerge include paying bills, reviewing statements, and other duties, including navigating the insurance and foreign exchange markets. As you can see, there's a diversity in the everyday financial tasks that a family caregiver undertakes on a daily basis. Next slide, please. Other categories of financial management tasks are executed, but on a more infrequent basis, include advice on issues surrounding savings, investment, and retirement, and document management, including the management of legal documentation. What's clear from survey data is that family caregivers undertake many different types of tasks that touch upon financial and legal management and planning, both on a frequent and infrequent basis. Relevant to today's RFA program, uh, previous slide, please. Relevant to, to this program and to the call for action is a role of technology in supporting caregivers as they undertake these duties. Next slide, please. Available evidence from the AARP suggests that there's a real thirst among surveyed family caregivers in engaging in different types of technology in ways to help them manage finances and making finance legal decisions. From this survey from the AARP, over 60% and 70% of surveyed family caregivers expressed interest in technology for their legal and financial management care responsibilities respectively. The red arrows on this slide point to, to those areas mentioned before. The same report also identified several barriers to caregiver adoption to technology that's, that's good to, to keep in mind while designing your own product or device or technology. This is included on the right-hand side of, uh, of the slide, and barriers include sole use or absence of a one-stop shop platform, devices and technologies that are cost prohibitive and thereby infrequently used, technologies that are increasingly complex, a real mismatch between solutions and identified needs of the family caregiver, current tools are not often validated, available tools lack cultural relevance or not personalized to the individual or to the user, and few solutions designed for use for low socioeconomic status communities. Hopefully these set of slides gave you both an overview of ACL, the demographic imperative of why finding solutions for this growing population is important, and then some technology and family caregiving needs and trends to keep in mind. I'll now pass the baton to Dana, who will provide further information about the solicitation and the solutions we're looking for. Dana? Thanks, I just appreciate that. Um, so I, I get the easy job because my colleagues have set us up in terms of describing the small business program, giving you the background about the needs that the uh, request for applications addresses and telling you a bit about um, the, our different organizations. So I'm in the Division of Behavioral and Social Research at the National Institute on Aging. I will try to avoid using acronyms wherever I can, or at least I'll try to spell them out. So I'm at NIA, National Institute on Aging. Uh, the division that I'm in is one of four extramural divisions. Um, the others are a division of neuroscience, division of geriatrics and clinical gerontology, and the division of aging and biology. Each of those divisions has an interest in different aspects of aging. Uh, I hope from the label of my division, behavioral and social research, you can understand that we have an interest in caregiving and caregiver research and supporting them. I saw a question in the, in the chat asking about what's the relationship between ACL and NIA or NIH. Uh, we're both operating divisions of uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. In this particular instance, um, ACL and NIA have a shared interest in the area of helping caregivers of persons with dementia specifically, but also more broadly helping caregivers for all the reasons that I just, just went over. 
So my division supports research on a variety of topics um, related to Alzheimer's disease, but outside of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, within the AD universe, the Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's disease related uh, research. Uh, we support all kinds of research having to do with dementia care, caregiver research, uh, uh, dementia epidemiology, so on and so forth. Um, as an example of that interest, we just recently, last month, uh, sponsored the second uh, summit, the National Research Summit on Care Services and Supports for Persons with Dementia and Their Caregivers. Uh, as you would probably expect this year, it was a virtual summit. Last uh, three years ago, it was in person, uh, but the proceedings of the summit are archived and available online. Uh, you can access our website and follow links that get you to those recordings. Uh, there will be a document coming out of that um, meeting that outlines sort of areas of interest and uh, areas targeting future research opportunities. It's that kind of an initiative that led to our uh, working with ACL on developing this particular funding opportunity announcement. So earlier in the slide set, you heard us referring to funding opportunities or FOAs. Those are funding opportunity announcements. This particular one, next slide please, is uh, RFA, that's a request for applications, AG, standing for National Institute on Aging, 21-025. You can look that up online. And uh, you'll see that among other things, we're looking to support research and development and tools for the currently underdeveloped market that serves caregivers and their family members suffering from AD and AD related uh, disorders. In particular, we wanna stimulate research and technology and tools that adapt to a range of levels of expertise and experience um, that are specific to the care demands of the targeted audience and that meet the needs of family caregivers who are under tremendous burden in terms of not only oftentimes caring for their family member with dementia, but oftentimes it's somebody who's caring for their own family at the same time. So to stimulate, uh, we wanna stimulate research and development uh, tools that integrate web and mobile out educational applications into a common platform for family caregivers. We wanna promote accessibility for individuals across the socioeconomic spectrum and with varying levels of technological sophistication. So in that funding opportunity announcement, we identified different um, areas that might be focused on by such platform, including power of attorney, medical advance directives, budgeting, social security, living arrangements, estate planning, care navigation, care coordination. Next slide, please. It's important for you to keep in mind the deadlines for uh, this opportunity. Uh, another question that came up in chat asked whether this is a one-time solicitation or will it be reissued? Most requests for applications, which this is an RFA, it's a one-time solicitation. So right now there's not a plan to reissue it in the future. So the due date for applications is November 12th. We ask if you are intending to submit an application, you submit a letter of intent. That would be due a month before that deadline of November 12th. Uh, that letter of intent ought to include uh, the elements that Todd talked about earlier, the outline of the specific aims and such like that. But we'd also ask you to identify who the key members of the team are that are carrying out the research because that helps us in terms of then setting up the review and making sure that we don't have conflicts of interest in the review panel. At the end of the funding opportunity announcement, you'll see that there is a person identified as a review contact. The review, like for most all um, small business applications submitted to the National Institutes of Health, the review is going to take place in the Center for Scientific Review and Dr. Wei Jini is identified as the point of contact currently for um, that review group that will convene sometime after obviously the applications come in, probably the early part of um, next year, February or so in 2021. Um, if your application doesn't fit this particular solicitation, like Todd mentioned earlier, there are other opportunities, there are other funding opportunity announcements that you may be able to identify in which your uh, project may fit. An example would be the omnibus date, uh, the omnibus calls for applications, and the next due date for those is January 5, 2021. Next slide, please. So um, I'm, I'm thinking that if you tuned into this webinar, aside from learning some of the mechanics of, of how to apply, uh, you're probably interested in what kinds of solutions are we actually looking for. And I just touched on some of these, um, these areas of interest in outlining uh, the, the existing research. So 
We're thinking the, select, the successful solutions will be ones that are adaptable to the caregiver experience and their abilities. It ought to be cost-effective and scalable. It ought to be user-centered for individuals across the socioeconomic spectrum and effective for um, people that are in, in, living in underrepresented, uh, who are from underrepresented populations, sorry. Uh, they, it's perfectly fine for the solutions to be generalizable to non-dementia caregivers, but this specific call is really focused on dementia caregiving, and so that ought to be featured as part of your um, application development. And there should be an incorporation of machine learning or artificial intelligence in support of tailor-made content, the idea being that uh, the, the solution ought to be adaptive to the learning of the individual who's using that system. All right, so next slide, I think, uh, brings us to um, the summary of how you can connect with us at NIA. And then um, we do the Twitter thing. We do the, I think is the, um, there's also a link somewhere in here for LinkedIn. Uh, but these are some of the different ways that you can follow what's going on at the National Institute on Aging. And with that, I think we now move to questions, right? Thanks. Yes. Thank you very much, Dana. And I also wanted to introduce, uh, on the line, we have Brian Bard. So the for this funding opportunity, it will be managed by the National Institute of Aging. So any questions as far as application should go to the NIA. But if you are interested in ACL's other interests um, and their SBIR program, then Brian would be a great point of contact. And um, I, I'm not sure if Brian's... Uh, enabled to speak. Um, if you all, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Great, thanks. So yeah, ACL does have its own small SBIR program located within uh, an operating division or small agency known as the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. We are under ACL, sort of like ACL is under HHS. We are not part of the NIH in any way. And um, we're not part of the omnibus that is run um, that you guys work with at the NIA, of course. We only hold uh, one um, phase one application opportunity per year. It usually comes out sometime in December and we hold one phase two. And that funding opportunity announcement usually comes out sometime in the spring. We, um, we have a small budget, our whole um, budget is about $3.2 million. We usually make about 10 phase one awards and about uh, four to five phase two awards. It's completely um, field initiated as long as it's designed to benefit the lives of people with disabilities and the elderly. Um, and uh, we don't do uh, fast tracking. We don't do direct phase two. And we run our own uh, peer review process with a panel of reviewers that we hire. It fluctuates from year to year, but we don't operate in the same, um, we don't have standing panels like the NIH does with the Omnibus. But um, we do, our, our phase ones are $100,000 for up to six months. And our phase two are $575,000 for both of two years. And, um, that's a real brief uh, <clears throat> introduction to our SBIR program. And we can expect, again, uh, phase one opportunities to come out sometime in December. Thanks very much, Todd. Perfect, perfect. But yes, again, anyone that's applying for this specific funding opportunity, um, you know, both myself uh, and Dana would be the, the perfect contact points. And then we can loop in uh, the jest as well. So uh, questions, Monique? Yes, and uh, thank you, Todd. I just wanted to let our participants know that we did send out a link via chat um, to the ACL SBIR program. Um, we're focused on this particular opportunity, but the, they may be a really good resource for those who are interested in learning more, so please feel free to check them out. With that said, we have several questions that have come in, and thank you to some of the panelists who have gone ahead and started uh, kicking us off on some of those uh, responses as we were going through the presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions about um, the requirements. Uh, this is coming in for Dana. Can you please describe in more detail the requirements or restrictions around including clinical studies versus other types of research covered by this grant opportunity? 
Uh, yes, sure, I can do that. <laughs> so any any um, any uh, project that involves an intervention that would be considered a clinical trial. So this would be an intervention to which people um, there's some kind of it's like the vaccine trials you hear about now, where there's going to be some kind of experimental group and then some kind of a control group, and and participants are assigned randomly to one or the other. That would be considered a clinical trial. And there are certain steps that have to be taken in order to register such a study uh, in clinicaltrials.gov so that there can be registration and then follow-up of uh, recruitment. And there are certain uh, provisos that need to be met. Uh, I can't go into the details of all that now, but if you decide uh, that you are going to submit such an application, then you don't want to come in under this particular request for applications because as I'm looking at the funding opportunity announcement, it says clinical trial not allowed. So you, you really ought not to be doing a clinical trial kind of intervention in response to this particular call. We have other funding opportunity announcements where such would be allowed. In this case, though, the idea is to develop a technology that can be useful to people and then to demonstrate its utility in, in meeting some of these criteria that we outline in the funding opportunity. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, it does. This uh, next question is for Todd. And before I move forward with that, I want to encourage folks to please fill out the feedback form. We have chatted a link to that feedback form. Um, also, please join our community on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, and we are still taking questions. So uh, we have tracked all the ones that have come in thus far. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature. It should be at the bottom of your screen. Todd, we have some folks who are newer to the SBR and SCTR program, um, and it wanted to see if you could please just reiterate um, the requirements, whether they're coming in through a particular phase or, or a fast track. Um, and then if you could also spend a few minutes talking about the application assistance program for folks who have never applied to uh, an NIH SBR in the past. Sure. So the um, a couple of things there. So thank you. That's a perfect slide. Um, so generally, uh, let's say for the omnibus or that AD solicitation PS-19-316, you can come in as either a phase one, a fast track, or direct to phase two. A phase one would be, you know, oftentimes you may not have any data. Um, you know, you really want to develop proof of concept. Now, to be competitive, it still helps to have data, um, preliminary data, but many times people don't. Um, and they'll develop proof of concept through that phase one study, usually six months to a year in length. Then there is a fast track where you're taking what is that phase one and then that phase two, which you can apply for once you finish the phase one, and that two year more development focus usually includes some validation efforts. In the fast track, at the same time, you're submitting a phase one and phase two application. And you'd have essentially one page of, for the specific aims that would show both the phase one and the phase two aims. The way a fast track works is that towards the end of your phase one period, you will be required to submit a progress report. And in that progress report, you will have to show how you have addressed the quantitative milestones that are necessary in a phase one of a fast track application. If the program officer at the National Institute of Aging agrees that you've met those milestones, then you will transition to phase two. The big advantage there is you would not have to then apply for phase two and go through review again and all that. So it can easily save nine months or more between the phase one and the phase two. So that's how the fast track works. Now, just in the past couple of years, Congress reauthorized us to do what's called direct to phase two, in which you can come in directly for phase two if you've actually done phase one type effort using other funds. So in that case, as part of your direct to phase two application, you would show the proof of concept data from um, that you've done, you know, through other funding. Um, so those are, are the three mechanisms. Again, important to note that for this funding opportunity, 
we expected, you know, some prototype platforms to be available and things of that sort. So we limited it to fast track and to direct to phase two. Um, but if you're going to apply for the omnibus or the open-ended AD solicitation that I mentioned, the phase one is another, um, another, uh, you know, way you can come in. Now the applicant assistance program is actually meant for phase one applications. So it, it wouldn't necessarily be relevant if you're gonna apply only to this solicitation. Now, again, you can have multiple applications. So if you have a platform type technology and you wanna you know, develop it for caregiver training in this solicitation, but then you also wanna come in for the omnibus or the AD solicitation on January 5th for another utility relating to aging, then for that application, you could in fact come in through the applicant assistance program. Um, so it, um, the web link was sent. There is a webinar for the applicant assistance program coming up very shortly. I'm forgetting the date, but I know it's in the chat, September 15th. So about a week away. Um, I definitely encourage you to attend that webinar if you've not ever received an SBIR before from the NIH. It is a great opportunity to get some coaching, help demystify that process. What really needs to be in that application? That's a, a great opportunity. For the applicant assistance program, we specifically encourage you know, companies that are led or owned by underrepresented populations, um, including both you know, women, minorities, economically, um, disadvantaged individuals. Thank you, Todd. Hopefully that addresses the question. Uh, I just want to put in, uh, let me just echo Monique's plug on two things. One is our LinkedIn page. We just launched that in the past week. Really excited about it. Um, it's going to be a great way for us to push out content, new funding opportunities, new initiatives, new webinars, uh, to our community. We, we do webinars very regularly. We'll be advertising them there. So I definitely encourage you to follow us on LinkedIn. And also, you know, we're doing these webinars a lot more regularly right now. And it's important for us to learn, are we doing them right? The more value we can provide. So that feedback form is really important. So please uh, click that link for the feedback form for today's webinar and tell us how this can be as optimal as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. And since you're giving tips, another one is before you apply, do reach out to the program officer um, and we have a put and we'll do it again, people you can contact. We do like to hear from you and want to help you be successful. So don't be afraid to reach out and ask questions. Um, we are seeing a couple of questions about whether this presentation will be available. We will be sending out the uh, presentation slides um, very shortly after this presentation. However, we're also gonna have a recording of it. It'll take a little bit more time to get that on the website, but we will post it um, so in a, in a version that is 508 compliant. So the next question comes from folks who um, are academic researchers and they wanna know um, whether they can apply, do they need a small business partner to be able to apply, and how can they maintain their IP rights that they're developing in the lab? Great. So um, for this funding opportunity, you would need, the application needs to come from a small business. So um, you could partner with a small business, um, and in that case, you know, we would require that you and the small business work out the intellectual property agreements, you know, potential licenses, things of that nature. Um, but yes, for this solicitation, it, it is required to come from a small business. Thank you. Todd, are there set asides for women owned uh, and economically disadvantaged small businesses? We do not have set asides for those populations for the, the small business programs. Thank you. And I should note that on the NIA, National Institute on Aging Small Business Innovation Research page, we do have some resources that are directly targeted for folks um, from uh, traditionally disadvantaged, underserved 
um, small businesses. Um, we also mentioned that the application assistance program is designed to help support and in increase diversity in our applications. So we do encourage you to apply. Exactly. And diversity supplements as well help bring in more diverse populations to existing awards, which is critical. Thank you. Does the RFA have a focus on educational content only, or is the intent to also accept solutions that can help uh, support uh, and complete a POA and other documents, for example? I will yield to my colleagues on that. It, this is Vijay. I'll, I'll, I could just step in. Um, and certainly, Todd and Dana certainly uh, welcome your feedback. I, I would say I think it's it's um, an all hands on deck type of approach. Um, you know, one of the slides uh, we looked at uh, or we shared rather uh, data from uh, a survey um, from ARP, uh, wherein an infrequent task was legal management. And that does include POA among other documents. Um, I believe it's, yeah, this slide, this is exactly it. So, um, and I saw another question about whether, um, whether we can recommend uh, services or tools that are ideal for financial management or, the, or, the, or legal management. I hesitate on that because I think, uh, I don't wanna recommend or, or you know, as uh, folks that help design this RFA or FOA, don't want to recommend certain tools over the others because I think there are certain best practices that Dana provided and, and that I provided in terms of devising a, a piece of technology or product or some type of tool that, that um, is effective and that's meaningful to the user and the individual. Um, so beyond just educational platforms, there are, there are opportunities that we tried to highlight both in the FOA at the link and also in this presentation on a couple of slides that I shared in terms of identified family caregiver needs in the realms of financial management and legal management that one could use as roadmaps to then identify a, a stated area of need from the potential user community that then you can go and construct tools and, and services around those needs. So um, I don't know, Dana, if you wanted to supplement what I shared or, or had any other thoughts. No, I think you're exactly right, Jeff, and, and I appreciate you stating it so clearly. Um, we don't want to be prescriptive about the solution. We want to help the, uh, the family caregivers. That's the name of the game here. And you presented some very compelling data showing that this is not just a need right now, but it's a need that's going to grow in the future. And so I think uh, what we're looking for are, uh, you know, resourceful, innovative, thoughtful solutions to helping out these family caregivers. Exactly. I'll, I'll just say just one other one other comment if I'm if I'm allowed to. Um, I think it's really that having that need and being able to demonstrate that your solution answers a specific need um, is going to be very important. And I think uh, a lot of solutions miss the miss the boat, so to speak, by constructing a solution without a need, um, sort of solution and in, in search for the question. Uh, but I would really start out with the need of the family caregivers and hopefully we provided some sort of overview for that and certainly the source, the, the, there are links to the sources that uh, resources that we pulled from, among others, right? It's not just, not just ARP or World Health Organization or other organizations, but there, there's a real wealth of data and information that's growing over the past couple of years, identifying these as real needs and, and served as the impetus for this collaboration between NI and ACL for this FOA. So uh, I would start there and, and, and start uh, constructing solutions around that. So thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is for Todd. Would a submission require that the primary researcher partner with an academic research institution? So if it is a small business applying, there is not a requirement to partner with an academic research institution it is optional. Thank you. We're also getting a few questions about uh, what data is needed to be able to successfully apply. Uh, so one question that came through is during the review process, reviewers often want to see power analysis. 
um, which may not of often be necessary for proof of concept and feasibility. Is there a strategy to help alleviate that uh, so that reviewers are not doing that? Or do you have any feedback for the potential applicant on the type of data they should include? Yeah, so I'm happy to start. And uh, Dana, as a former SRO, probably has a lot more useful guidance on this one than I do. Um, you know, I think generally, yes, making sure the reviewers have the right expectations is critical. We're actually in the process of optimizing the peer review process for the SBR program overall at the NIH. But, you know, in terms of concrete things you can do, I think it's really important in your application, let's say you're doing a fast track or, you know, let's say it's not through this solicitation and you're doing it through the omnibus, something that accepts a pure phase one application, that you be able to explain what you're going to do in phase two and why the why the phase one is limited to the study that you're proposing. Um, I think when it's, when it's explained to the reviewers in that way that, you know, you you are following the budget limits, you know, and, and this is as much as you could do here, but but here is why the, you know, the types of, let's say the lack of statistically significant, but the trend will help you then figure out how to do that statistically significant study in phase two and why that's helpful. That That's the type of thing that you really need to uh, crystallize in your application. Uh, Dana, hopefully you can provide a little more guidance here as well. So my, my colleague, Todd, fell into the acronym world, which was, yes. he, used, he called me an SRO. I used to be a scientific <laughs> review officer. And as a scientific review officer, I used to run small business review panels. And so I got to hear over 14 years, a lot of uh, feedback from reviewers about what was being proposed. And Todd used a, a phrase earlier that I think should stick in your mind when it comes to um, either the uh, fast track application or a direct to phase two, and that is proof of concept. So a phase one study is all about feasibility. It's all about feasibility. Is the concept feasible that you're proposing? And, and one measure of that is getting input from end users, prospective end users, health professionals, whoever it might be, about the usefulness, their perceived, the perceived value of this tool that you're proposing to develop. And so I think that um, the, the question raised an excellent point about power analysis, and isn't that really more appropriate for phase two? The answer is yes, but it's incumbent upon you as an applicant to make a case for why whatever you have done so far, talking about the direct to phase two, whatever work you've done so far, how does that establish the feasibility of the prototype you've developed for then being implemented in the way that you're proposing for phase two? And so Todd made reference to, to things like quantitative milestones. What are the milestones that were accomplished that show the feasibility of this technology for accomplishing its end goal? A big mistake that a lot of, of uh, applicants make is in the context of phase one, whether it's in a fast track or a standalone phase one, they do, a, they, they do something called a pilot test of the effectiveness of the program. And they get killed on that because there's never a big enough sample size. This goes back to the power point that was raised in the question. So avoid doing any test of effectiveness in phase one. Phase one is not about effectiveness. That's the work of phase two. Phase one is really about feasibility and what data to, do you have to show that it's feasible? Now, somebody asked a question about would market research count as that? And NIA, NIH does not support market research. You don't want to build market research into any plan that you're proposing for funding, but, but for sure it's worth your while to do some kind of, a, of a assessment of what exists out there so that you can um, convince the reviewers that what you're proposing is innovative and has potential for accomplishing what you want it to accomplish. So I kind of hit a couple of different points there, but phase one is all about feasibility. If you're coming in with a direct to phase two, you want to show that you've done some preliminary work to establish the feasibility of this system that now you're proposing to test for effectiveness in phase two. Yeah, and I can add a couple things to, to the last few comments that Dana mentioned. So in terms of the, the market research component, so in the phase one, you can ask, I think it's up to $8,000 for technical assistance. It's not much for phase one. It's up to 50,000 for phase two. 
but that can include market research. The NIH traditionally also has had um, programs such as the assessment program. That, that's all being kind of redone, um, but there will be, for if you don't ask for the $8,000 in technical assistance in your phase one, but you do get awarded, there will be NIH programs that help provide some of that technical assistance that could include market research. And the other thing to note is that the commercialization readiness program, which you can apply for once you have a phase two, does allow for market research, but not in a traditional NIH grant as like an SBIR phase one or phase two, as Dana said. In terms of that last point about, you know, being able to know who your customer are and crystallize that in application, that's really important and really important to include in your commercialization plan. And letters of support from potential end users are, um, are really helpful in applications as well. Thank you both. I recognize we're coming close to time, so I'm just going to note that we will stay on a bit longer because we're seeing some really good questions come through and want to make sure we're being as responsive as possible. But for those who do have to leave, we do want to thank you for joining us and please do fill out that feedback form and join our communities as we mentioned earlier and we'll chat those out again. Uh, the next question is how many awards are expected to be made under the solicitation and what's the time frame from the time that the application is submitted to when a, a small business may expect to hear back on whether they've been awarded? So the time frame, I'll handle that one first because I know that off the top of my head. Uh, the time frame generally, I believe these will be May Council. Uh, so an expected award would probably be sometime around July. However, um, you will receive your score likely in about three months post-application. And from that score, we will be able to give you a pretty good idea. You know, for, for 80 plus percent of the applications, we can give you a pretty good idea from the score if it'll be funded. The, the last 20% are those ones right around the border where we need to do more diligence on our end, you know, to know if it'll be funded and those take a little longer. But, but like I said, for most people within three months, you'll have your score and we'll be able to give you a pretty good guidance on funding likelihood at that point. In terms of the number of awards, I'm trying to remind myself. Um, I know uh, the FOA says six awards. Thank you, perfect. I was just looking it up, perfect. Thank you, Dana. So six awards um, are expected. It's a one-time funding opportunity. So, you know, we would be able to go up to, but really it's gonna be based on quality. Um, you know, and score and things of that nature. Thank you. Um, quick question on um, clarifying who people need to contact for which funding opportunity. So some folks have asked about the omnibus and who's the appropriate contact, and then who should they contact for this specific uh, funding opportunity announcement? Thanks. So ND Kearns is really the ideal um, initial contact for all funding all SBIR and STTR funding announcements at the NIA. Uh, he has um, tremendous expertise and guidance to give on SBIRs, um, and thus it is, is a great first place to go. Um, for this specific opportunity, you know, there may be specific scientific questions that, you know, MD may, be, may refer you to Dana or myself, but I, I would definitely encourage everyone to, to consider MD as the first point of contact. And uh, uh, Melissa, please chat about his, his email. Todd, Todd, I would just say also, this is Dana, that um, every funding opportunity announcement, if you look way down to the bottom of the page, it will tell you who the scientific contact is. So for those on the bus solicitations, there'll be a list of people and there ought to be somebody at the NIA, probably MD Kearns, um, but they'll be listed at the very bottom of the solicitation, uh, peer review contact, which is for review and a scientific research contact. Thank you. Uh, someone is asking uh, whether the ACL or the area agencies on aging might be potential customers for products developed as a result of this uh, funding opportunity announcement? And is there any advantage in, in engaging the local area agency on aging? Yeah, this is the Jeff. Um, 
I'm, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to speak on whether triple A's or area, area agencies on aging's are potential clients, but certainly I think it's, it's wise uh, going back to the market research uh, point uh, when attempting to test out a solution, help shape or mold or frame a question or even the solution or even to identify potential customers to do as much research as possible. So I see a potential value add. Now it's not incumbent that you do this to, to get an award or anything like that, but uh, I see there's, a, there's an advantage as is with anything to do as much homework on folks that are on the ground, that are, that are engaging with family caregivers on a daily basis, uh, that might have a very nuanced understanding of the needs that they're going through both on a daily, monthly, yearly basis and then use that information to then inform um, both the design of the solution, the delivery of the solution, the, and the analysis, interpretation, and effectiveness of the solution. So certainly uh, there are opportunities there that uh, in the course of doing your market analysis or even testing out your solution or even testing whether there's a need that uh, one could engage with uh, AAAs, these area agencies on aging, and other folks within the aging network um, or even aging providers to then get an understanding of uh, uh, how your uh, solution might uh, quote unquote play in these communities. Thanks. Thank you. Next question is for Todd. Um, is it possible to get sample applications that NIA or ACL has funded in the past to help inform developing a successful application for this opportunity? So for this opportunity, it would really be the NIH um, opportunity, SBR sample applications that would be most relevant. Um, there are certain sample applications at the website for the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases that show sample applications for SBIR. Unfortunately, I don't think there are any that's kind of directly relevant to these types of platforms. It's actually something that we are actively working on. And I hope within the next couple of months, we will have those available, but it will likely be just too late for this funding opportunity. But it, it is something we realize will be of great value and we are working on. Thank you, Todd. Uh, we received a question about what, how does someone help decide which study section would be appropriate for what they are proposing. Well, and they are specifically noting uh, work related to dementia patients. Dana, do you want to? So, talk? Yeah, I, thanks Todd. Um, so for this particular funding opportunity announcement, there will be a special, a, a dedicated special emphasis panel is my understanding of the way this is going to work. So um, there's no need to shop around for a study section for an application submitted to this specific call. That being said, if you submit an application under any of those omnibus solicitations, then it's probably worth having a conversation with the um, scientific, uh, the peer review contact, uh, but also um, with the scientific contact. I would say talk with the program officer, scientific contact first, um, talk about ideas that you may have about, you know, what kind of a review group would be appropriate. You can also, anybody, because it's a publicly available website, can go to the Center for Scientific Review. So if you do whatever is your favorite search engine and type in a bunch of acronyms, NIH space CSR, Center for Scientific Review, space study section. So well, you could actually do small business and that search will pull up a listing of the small business study sections and you can read a description of each one of those. Um, once you have that, that elevator pitch, that specific aims page that Todd talked about, it's a really good idea to reach out not only to program staff, but to the scientific review officer and ask that scientific review officer if they think that their study section has appropriate expertise to review that application. Thank you. And with that, I just wanna remind folks to please fill out the feedback form. I recognize that we are at time. Um, however, if you have an additional question, please do reach out to us. We will also do another scan of all the questions we received. And if you have included uh, your name, we'll be able to follow up with you to respond to your question. 
Um, but I want to thank you for taking the time to learn more about this funding opportunity as well as this collaboration between ACL and NIA. And I want to thank all of the panelists, Todd, Dana, Vijet, and also thank you, Brad, for uh, joining us. Um, we hope that you will reach out to us with your questions, that you will feel comfortable in you know, coming to us to help you think through how to successfully apply and that you join our community, that this is not just a one-time webinar, but that we get to know you better and uh, you can join our LinkedIn and Twitter network as well as be a part of our email list and upcoming funding opportunities. Thank you all for joining and uh, Todd and team, I'll just let's see if you have any last parting words for our potential applicants. No, thank you. Um, and as I said, any, any qu questions or if you'd like to send your specific games page or, you know, have any questions about kind of, you know, how to frame a grant or anything, you know, that can be sent to Dr. MD Kearns at kearnsmd at mail.nih.gov, um, as was said in the chat. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day and good luck on your applications. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers. <laughs>